Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this very cosy fireplace on this very cold and very frosty winter's night. Now, if you are in need of some nice, comforting sleep stories, but maybe you're not feeling all that festive yet, allow me to help. We'll tell you some short wintry tales, some are Christmassy, some are not, but one thing is for sure you'll be feeling a little more festive afterwards. So I've got a cup of tea here, we've got a lovely bottle of wine warming up by the fire, might have a glass later on, you never know. But please make yourself very comfortable. As always, lie back, take a nice deep breath, and welcome to wintry fairy tales and sleep stories with Snooze with Sam. Right, let's start with a wee one that I wrote ages ago. It's called, mm, actually, <laughs> try and figure out which ones they are. We'll test your memory. But at the very least, just lie back and enjoy them for what they are. Right. On this cool winter's night, the little fire gives you some much-needed heat. Beneath the clear night sky, you are perched on a large piece of driftwood which has ended up on the banks of Loch Awe, your home for the evening. Overhead, a billion stars twinkle against a deep, inky galaxy, occasionally obscured by a slight haze. But for the most part, you can see every detail on this dark canvas. The silhouettes of the surrounding hills lurk on the horizon, sleeping very peacefully. It is around 11pm, and the world is now quiet and calm, especially in somewhere so far from people. Your fire glows, burning fiercely in the gloom, lighting up your surroundings in a wonderful glow. Oh, surprised it took me that long before I yawned. <laughs> Not enough to see every detail, but enough to make out most shapes. You are sat around 10 metres from the tree line, behind which is the small, single-track road you took to get here. The little grassy and pebbly beach oh. started now. <laughs> the little grassy and pebbly beach seemed like the ideal little spot on which to pitch your tent and set up camp for the night. The sun was low when you arrived, but gave you plenty of light by which to set up and forage for dead wood to burn. You knew it was going to be cold. As the sky had been clear all day. 
Once you got your fire lit, you fetched some water from a nearby stream and heated it up to make yourself a cup of tea in your little metal pan. As the water warmed, starting to bubble and steam, you looked over the water in appreciation of the beauty of the loch. You watch the little ripples appear occasionally on the water as tiny fish surface and jump, catching flies in flight. Nearer to you, you watch small pond skaters Oh. Oh. I don't think I'm going to be able to get through these. <laughs> I'm too tired myself. Hopefully that rubs off on you though. Where was I? <laughs> uh, yes, okay. N nearer to you, you watch small pond skaters dart about in the shallows beneath the harmless clouds of gnats going about their business. It is so still and so quiet. Only the tinkle of the stream and the crackle of your now well-burning fire shimmer through the night air. All alone, you feel much-needed respite from the buzz of the city. It's so important to allow yourself some space to breathe. Unpacking your favourite mug, you brew your tea, clasping the hot mug with both of your hands letting the heat penetrate them and warm them through. Just as I'm doing just now. Before you know it, darkness falls, and there you sit, totally at ease, and feeling as relaxed as you have ever done, keeping toasty by your fire. You stare into the flames and watch them flick and dance and then disappear, only to be replaced by the next. Deep in the belly of the fire, you see the wood splintering and crackling. For something so violent, you find it so peaceful and soothing, almost hypnotic. Gazing into the flames, you see nothing else around you, the light causing your pupils to narrow. Your peripheral vision is vague, with the fire being your only focal point. You decide to fetch your sleeping mat and lay it out beside the fire. As you feel tiredness and fatigue come over you, much like me just now, oh. Excuse me, everyone. I'll be asleep before you at this stage. As you feel tiredness and fatigue come over you, you lay down, place your head on your still rolled up sleeping bag, and gaze up at the stars. Suddenly, the sky seems vast. 
it stretches across your whole field of vision. It's completely surreal, the number of stars. Too many to begin to comprehend. It feels like you are looking up at a two-dimensional picture rather than the literal night sky. Your mind wanders to what else might be out there. Such a still and silent image. As your eyes adjust back to the darkness, the Milky Way becomes visible. A very deliberate patch of denser, whiter glow stretching across the middle of the sky. Every now and again, you catch a glimpse of a shooting star, some of them too fast to see with confidence, and some of them longer and slower, taking their time to cross the sky. Any movement at all, and your eyes pick it out. Small satellites cruising from corner to corner, continuous, relentless in their journey around the world. You feel your eyes getting heavier as you stare upwards still. Each tiny speck of light. Millions and millions of miles away. Oh, honestly, I'm going to be in bed before you. Either that or I'll end up falling asleep by the fire. And spill my tea because I'm holding it in my left hand, but we'll hope that that, that doesn't happen. <laughs> I don't know whether you find it helpful that I'm so tired or not, but I truly do hope that, subliminally at least, it makes you feel sleepier. So I don't know whether to apologise for my exhaustion or not. <laughs> we'll go with it though, but you'll have to excuse my very regular yawning. Anyway, I think it's the heat from the fire. It doesn't help, and the fact it's quite dimly lit in here, which is lovely. But it doesn't take me much to feel sleepy sometimes. It's usually when I need to be awake. <laughs> That's not quite true. But when I am reading these stories, as you, I do get very sleepy. Which I suppose is the point, isn't it? Anyway, you are relying on me just now, so... How about, how about one a little more festive? I imagine most of you will know what this one is. Okay, here we go. The excitement is tangible. The whole of Hogsmeade, there's your clue. <laughs> The whole of Hogsmeade buzzes like a hive of festive bees, all hurrying to get their last minute festivities underway. It's an amazing sight. Every wizard and witch seems to be here, all wrapped up in layer upon layer of warm wintry clothing 
desperately trying to keep out the cold on this Christmas Eve. But you don't feel the cold, for you are too busy soaking up the atmosphere with wide eyes and the most cheerful of smiles. Well, maybe you do feel the cold after all, as you subconsciously pull your cloak and parka closer around your midriff, isolating a stray icy breeze. Thankfully, you've already finished the majority of your Christmas shopping, so you don't have to battle with the crowds in an effort to fetch gifts for your friends and family. Quite simply, you're here purely to drench yourself in the atmosphere of this wonderful time of year, embracing the love and care everyone so willfully radiates. Walking down Hogsmeade High Street, scanning your eyes high and low, left and right, the village hustles and bustles with all sorts of goings on, and is a feast for the eyes, ears, and chilly red nose. Every thatched roof cottage and shop is covered by the crispest snowfall, small icicles dangling from their gable ends. Only last night did the overcast clouds above drop a lovely soft carpet of fresh powder, much to the excitement of all the students come the morning. Today, the high street has been packed and compounded by a thousand footsteps, but the smallest, most delicate snowflakes still drift down to earth, riding the still air. By the side of the road, Every tree glistens with snow, as though someone has dusted them with icing sugar. Between the trees, as well as amongst the branches of some, adding to the shimmer and glitter of the snow, hundreds upon hundreds of enchanted candles glow and flicker like wee fairies hanging in space. They move and sway ever so gently in the light breeze, giving everyone below a little extra light in which to pick their next path through the snow and the crowds. You pass some of your favourite places to spend your free time. Honeydukes, the one and only sweet shop worth visiting, in your humble opinion. Stepping a little closer to the steamy windows, you can feel your face light up from the glow inside as you peer in. There are shelves upon shelves of the most succulent looking sweets imaginable. Creamy chunks of nougat, shimmering pink squares of coconut ice, fat honey-coloured toffee, 
hundreds of different kinds of chocolate in neat rows. Not only that though, there is a large barrel of Bertie Bots, every flavour beans, and another of Fizzing Wisbees, the levitating sherbet balls that Ron had mentioned. You can nearly feel your teeth aching at the sights of all those trees. You've got plenty of things already in your dorm, so maybe best to move on before you pillage the entire shop. Moseying further down the street, there is barely any room to squeeze between the excited bustle of witches and wizards. All of them darting from door to door of the village establishments. Zonko's Joke Shop, an ever popular place. But it's absolutely hoaching around Christmas, full of friends who are desperate to prank their peers without even needing an invitation. Then there's tomes and scrolls, a beautiful little bookshop that still stands suitably peaceful on your right hand side. It would feel wrong if any place full of such knowledge and tranquility would become overladen by loud and noisy students. The Three Broomsticks Inn echoes with tipsy patrons, a constant stream of stumbling bodies falling out of the door whilst tagging their mates to go in. The Herbology Shop of Dogweed and Deathcap carries on about its business as usual. Scriven Shaft's quill shop is certainly cashing in on the crowds by the looks of it, as so many people rushed to gift their loved ones a beautiful new writing instrument. The hairdressing salon is busy with those after a seasonal trim. Dominic Maestro is in his music shop, letting his musical instruments sell themselves. And oh I, of course. There is Gladrag's wizard wear, one of your favourite clothing shops. It does stock normal clothes, if you can even call them that. But one of your favourite things to buy there is some of their famous, frankly lurid and garish socks. You can also purchase ones which scream when they get too smelly. <laughs> I remember writing that and I couldn't stop laughing and I had to keep recording it again, sorry. I just love that image, I don't know why. <laughs> but oh, you wouldn't know about that, obviously. You wouldn't, your socks would never scream. <laughs> Next along the cosy, candlelit street was Ollivander's one shop and Madame Puddifoot's tea shop, brimming with friends and couples, all keen to huddle up and get a good blether over a warm and steaming brew. There's so much to take in, 
evidently. But as you stroll down the road, hearing the muffled crunches of your boots in the snow, you feel suitably festive and satisfied with your afternoon. Time to head back to Hogwarts, you think. You feel the need of a warm brew yourself for a start, for the cold is starting to reach your toes. So leaving the Christmassy chaos of Hogsmeade behind you, you hurry yourself through the fallen snow, bracing against the increased wind out in the open. Keeping your head tucked down, each passing friend gets an excited wave and hello, but everyone appreciates the need to find a bit more shelter. The snowflakes may only be small, but once the wind carries them, they become little nose numbers in no time. Through the grounds of the school you shuffle, speeding past gates and through doorways and chilly corridors, ever more desperate to feel warm as time passes. Is that a fire you can hear? Well, yes, because we are here with one. <laughs> But in the story, it must be your imagination teasing you. Although you do hope that when you reach the common room, the fireplace will be roaring. Finally, you're inside the main buildings. A little less cold, but still not what you'd call hospitable. Nodding a greeting to great scholars and important people in the paintings on the walls, as you always do so, and they always appreciate, you hurry up the foyer steps, leaving snowy footprints on the rugs and wooden floorboards as you go. The janitors would not appreciate that necessarily. Upon reaching the common room door, you shiver the worst of the cold away as you utter the password through trembling lips. Painfully, the doorway opens slowly, taking its sweet time. But, oh, there it is. Heat. The fireplace. Is this what bliss feels like? It must be. Through the threshold you step closing the great heavy door behind you with a clunk. Your whole bodily tension drains away from you. The heat from the fireplace on the far wall engulfs you. You do love the common room. It's such a lovely place to spend time. For one, it's full of bonny, ornate furniture, dating back centuries and centuries. Most of it made from dark stained mahogany or oak. In the centre of the room, big, squishy leather Chesterfield sofas huddle around 
a huge log burning fire with small side tables, oil lamps and candles for essential ancillaries. Between long hanging curtains, the windows to the outside are plastered in snowfall. Every frame ledge gathering fresh flakes. It looks very cold indeed. A timely reminder of where you'd just come from. But no longer are you cold. Your nose and ears turn red hot as the circulation returns. Ron, Hermione and Harry knew you were coming back around this time. And as they always seem to do, bless them. You can see one of them has left you a mug of steaming hot chocolate. It's on the coffee table in front of the fire to keep it as warm as possible. It's so sweet of them to think of you. They really do look after you so well. Kicking off your boots and removing your parka, you hang them up by the fire to heat up and dry. Before settling, you lift the box of matches and light the nearest candle. It ignites with little complaint as it was probably not too far off self-combusting in this hot room anyway. Picking up the mug of cocoa and nestling into your favourite seat in the corner of the nearest sofa to the fire, you can finally relax. allowing your shoulders to fully untense. A huge wave of calm floods your system. As you sigh, close your eyes and take a sip Excuse me. from the still hot mug of hot chocolate. That is much better. Oh, you almost forgot. You've got a few presents which you've been told to open tonight. Placing your mug back on the table, you reach down the side of the sofa to a small pile of mostly neatly wrapped gifts with lovely wee bows fit with ribbons. Every year you insist that you don't want or need any gifts but just as you do yourself you know they all love to give on Christmas. Taking the first one from the small pile, you read the label, with love, from Hagrid. <laughs> Bless his massive cotton socks. This one's rough and readily wrapped, as you'd expect from him. His big hands would struggle to deal with such intricate work. You are just surprised it's not squished. P. 
peeling the corners of the paper away. You pull out from within a wee tin of treacle fudge. What a wonderful gift. He always gives it, every year. You think he enjoys it more himself, to be perfectly honest. Thank you very much, Hagrid. Next, another wee one which feels like a book. It reads, From Ron. Wrapped in beautiful brown paper, this one comes apart very easily, held together with minimal string. It is a book. Flying with the Cannons. A book about the Chudley Cannons. A well-known Quidditch team. How lovely. Ron knows how much you love the game. You suppose the next gift is from Hermione. It's wrapped with perfect technique and absolute precision. You feel bad for even unwrapping it at all. Under the soft glow of the crackling candle, you pull away the ribbon and the beautiful Prussian blue wrapping paper to reveal an eagle feathered quill. Wow, it is so beautiful. The large dark brown tail feather so immaculate and elegant. She knows you are a bit of a bookworm and writer too. How very thoughtful of her. Last but not least, the large, soft and loosely wrapped gift. On the label, scribbly handwriting reads, with love and wishes this Christmas, from Mrs. Weasley. P.S. Look after Ron, please. I do worry. What's she like? With a wee giggle, you pull open the string and withdraw a big, cosy, hand-knitted jumper, which you immediately pull over your head. It fits perfectly. How did she know? She's got such a keen eye, does Mrs. Weasley. Ah, that was lovely. Bless all of their cotton socks. You cannot wait to give them all of their gifts in return. Taking up your cocoa again. You snuggle a little further into the sofa, cuddling your new jumper, and just sit there, knees tucked in, watching and listening to the fire. It's so bewitching, watching the flames. So hypnotic and soothing all at once. With any luck, hopefully Ron, Hermione and Harry will be back soon themselves, so you can be with them whilst they open their gifts from you. That will make you very happy. But maybe there's time for a wee nap first. 
think I agree with that. <laughs> it would be rude not to in front of this fire. Mm. Sounds like a plan to me. Sweet dreams, everyone, and merry festivities. Take care. <laughs>